The Kings of Rome, A History of the Nation of Rome. Myths and warnings. That's really all the start of Rome is to us. Modern day historians like to use multiple sources and archaeological discoveries to determine what happened in the past. That's hard to do with the Roman Age of Kings. It took place between 753 BCE and 510 BCE, and even that we're kind of wishy-washy on. Archaeological evidence only supports the existence of two, possibly three, of the later kings. Much of Rome's beginning history was written by the later Romans. These men had their own personal and political agendas and often wrote the history of the start of Rome to send specific messages to Romans living during the time of the writing. There were seven kings in total, at least that's how many we think there were. Could possibly have been a few more. And their stories often include interactions with mythical creatures such as fortune tellers that lived for centuries and mysterious disappearances that are credited to the ascension into godhood. The foundation stories of Rome are actually tied to the Greek demigod Hercules, who is said to have cleared a path that allowed for locals to gain access to the area Rome would be built. Hercules wasn't real, but the Romans said that he was a part of their beginning. So this time period ends up being a bit more fiction than fact. Almost as fantastic as the outright myths are the longevity of the kings. Seven kings over 243 years would require an average reign of almost 35 years, well beyond the life expectancy of Roman emperors, who often were killed before year 12. Because of these issues, many historians don't use this information to figure out what happened during the era of kings, but instead to better understand the needs, concerns, and the politics of the Romans during the Republican and Imperial eras, who wrote these histories. For now, though, let's go ahead and pretend that the Romans weren't completely making everything up, and instead, let's study the first seven kings of Rome as the later Roman historians said they existed. The first leader of Rome is said to be a man named Romulus. He would serve from 753 BCE to about 716 BCE. Romulus, supposedly, was a direct descendant of the survivors of the Battle of Troy, which took place centuries earlier. Those survivors established a city known as Alba Longa, not far from where Rome would be built. Romulus and his twin baby brother Remus were cast from their homes by a paranoid and power-hungry uncle of their mother who feared the infants could challenge his reign as king of Alba Longa. They were saved by a she-wolf that nursed them until local herders found the kids and raised them as their own. Eventually, both boys would grow up, return to Albalanga, and help in the overthrow of their mother's evil uncle. As a reward, they were allowed to start their own city. While laying foundations for what would become Rome, both Romulus and Remus are said to have gotten into an argument. It then evolved into a fight, and in a burst of blind rage, Romulus kills his brother. After feeling bad for what he had done, he finishes the city anyway, and then named it after himself. You know, like all people who want to make up for their crimes do. Anyway, Romulus had a problem. No, not that he'd murdered his brother. He was past that. The real problem was that the founding population of Rome was too low, in the few thousands, and most of those were men. To help with this problem, Romulus and the early Romans accepted people from all over, from all different classes, even slaves and criminals. This wasn't enough, though. The true population problem Rome faced was that it had far too many men and not enough women. They would never be able to grow their population without a high birth rate. And no amount of immigration into Rome would solve that problem. So, Romulus arranges a festival and invites a neighboring tribe to attend. They were known as the Sabines, and once many had arrived, the Romans sprung their trap and seized all the unmarried women. The Sabines, naturally didn't appreciate this, and went to war with Rome, and they very nearly win. It's only because of the Sabine daughters, who are now married to Roman men, begging their people to spare the Romans and to agree to peace, that the war ends and Rome survives. After, Romulus actually manages to convince the Sabines to join Rome. This entire incident is known as the abduction of the Sabine women, and yet another clear indicator that the story of Romulus is fantasy. It's ridiculous to think that the Sabines, rightfully furious at the Romans, after having essentially beaten the Romans, and now basically the owners of all the Romans had, would not only allow for the Romans to go unpunished for kidnapping their daughters, but also then join the Romans and serve under Romulus. This means, thankfully, that those young women weren't abducted and brutalized. But don't breathe a sigh of relief just yet. The Romans still have plenty of horrible things for you to learn about. 
even more fantastical than the episode of the Sabines is the idea of how Romulus dies. There aren't solid stories on this, but a number of them said that one day he basically went on a walk and then ascended into the heavens to become a god. Ultimately, the Romulus story serves a couple of different needs. It explains to the Romans how their different groups came together to form their nation. It also gave them just cause to eventually invade and conquer the Greeks. Remember that connection to Troy? Well, the Romans of the Republican era were very much ready to seize the wealth and culture of Greece. But Roman culture demanded that their wars be justified. They needed to feel like they were the good guys. So, when later Romans made Romulus, the founding member of Rome, descended from Troy, a city that the Greeks destroyed, and whose people the Greeks massacred, it gave the Romans the ability to say that any war they waged against the Greeks was only retribution for what the Greeks had done to the ancestors of the Romans. The second king of Rome was Numa Pompilus. He ruled from 715 BCE to 672 BCE. His time as king is, well, simply put, kind of boring. But as anyone who pays bills knows, the boring things are the important things. Might not be fun to send that check in, but it keeps the lights on. Anyway, it seems that Numa's entire role, and the myth that is the heir of kings, is to explain to later Romans how their calendar and religious institutions were established. And while that's boring, it's also huge. Since for Romans, their gods permeated every single aspect of their lives. Success or failure relied entirely on how happy the gods were with you. One of the biggest needs of the people is food. Because of this, many gods are associated with phenomena such as weather and the health of plants and animals. One of the biggest impactors on those things is climate. So for the Romans, a great deal of time was spent worshipping gods that could control the climate. In order to know when to ask for help, you had to have a strong understanding of the passage of time, and that meant maintaining a calendar. Numa was credited with being responsible for two of the most vital things in Roman life. How to keep the gods happy, and how to keep track of the seasons. Given what other kings are credited with doing, Numa, while boring, comes out looking pretty good. Especially when we learn what happens to a few of the later kings. The third king of Rome is Tullus Hostilus, and he ruled from 672 BCE to 640 BCE. He was not like Numa, and didn't build up the infrastructure of Rome. He was more focused on taking the infrastructure of other nations. Why put all that time and effort in making it yourself when you can just take it from somebody else who did put in all that time and effort? One example of this is the conflict that he set up between Rome and its parent city, Alba Longa. Both sides agreed that a direct fight would be devastating for everyone. Instead, they came up with a compromise. Each city would send a set of triplet boys to do battle. It was agreed that whichever side lost would then surrender to the other. During the battle, two of the Roman triplets are killed while wounding the triplets from Alba Longa. The last Roman triplet, by the name of Publius, kills the three brothers from Alba Longa single-handedly. Publius returns to Rome, a hero. Then, in public, he kills his sister. So after that, Alba Longa... Huh? Oh, oh, oh you want to know why Publius went all stabby-stabby with his sister? Well, I mean, okay, if you think that's important. And yet another example of the Roman historians using these stories as lessons, they write that Publius' sister was married to one of the triplets from Alba Longa. When Publius returns, he's carrying the armor of the three dead brothers, and his sister recognizes her husband's armor. Overcome with grief, she falls to her knees in front of Publius, crying her eyes out. Publius, rather than having sympathy for his sister, becomes enraged draws his sword, and stabs her through the heart. Of course, this was frowned upon, and Publius was expected to walk around demonstrating his remorse. But no real consequences befall him. Why not? Because the Roman historians were trying to share a lesson. Loyalty to Rome should come before all else, and it is better to die or be killed than dishonor Rome. So, back to the main story. Alba Longa refuses to follow through on the agreement. The two cities go to war, and Alba Longa is defeated. Rome, under the leadership of King Tullius Hostilus, is victorious. Hostilus would order the city of Alba Longa burned to the ground, and its residents dragged to Rome. Not long after that, the people of Alba Longa would be given the opportunity to become Roman citizens. You see what the Romans did there? They set up a conflict with Alba Longa, 
they then win the conflict, and even though they're the ones that started this whole thing with Alba Longa, when Alba Longa says, no, we're not going to follow through on the agreement and let you take over our city, they then give themselves a justified reason in attacking Alba Longa and conquering that tribe and conquering those people and then burning the city to the ground. Basically, future Roman historians were justifying their behavior. Who knows if that's how it went? But the Romans were trying to make sure that everyone understood that the Romans were the good guys. Because, you know, good guys burn down entire towns and murder people. But they were also really, really nice. And they eventually allowed the Alba Longans to become Roman citizens. So, you know, in the end, the Romans are the good guys, clearly. So for the Romans, agreements are incredibly important. Alba Longa agreed to surrender if their fighters lost. They didn't. Because they didn't, Rome conquered them. A to B. Simple logic as far as the Romans are concerned. Another lesson, the final one, was that when people are defeated by the Romans, that they should be incorporated into Rome. Rather than constantly trying to suppress them and keep them in line, it made more sense to take the people that you'd recently defeated and tie their success to your success. So rather than constantly having to fight the people from Alba Longa, they made them Romans. They incorporated them into Roman society. So now when Rome succeeded, those former members of Alba Longa succeeded too. It's pretty devious. The fourth king of Rome was Ansus Marcius, and he ruled from 640 BCE to 616 BCE. The Romans were obsessed with feeling as if they were the good guys. They went to great lengths to make certain that they were okay by the gods and by their own personal view of themselves before waging war with another nation. Ansus was credited with implementing a rule that was followed for centuries. Whenever Rome believed itself ready to go to war, they sent a small group of representatives to the offending country. Upon reaching the border, those men prayed to the gods, essentially asking for permission to go to war. Then they entered the other country, went to the nearest city, and repeatedly told everyone they met why Rome was mad, how their issue could be fixed, and what was going to happen if it wasn't. After 30 days, that man returned to Rome, addressed the early senate, and they made the final decision to go to war. In addition to being credited with the rules for war, if you will, Ansys was given credit for starting the port city of Ostia. When it comes to the growth of nations, having easy access to the sea is critical, as it allows for them to import things they need and sell things they have too much of. Also, strong cities on the coast mean that you can build a strong navy, which is essential if you want to control something as vast as the Mediterranean Sea. And the Romans definitely had their eyes on the Mediterranean. So while it might not seem important that he helped to establish a port city, it was incredibly important for Rome's long-term ambitions and conquering the entire Mediterranean region. Now, up until this point, many historians agree the earlier kings might not have existed. And a lot more on the not than the might. In the case of Romulus, it's almost a guarantee. He wasn't real. Though it is possible the earlier kings were mashups of multiple other people. Because of archaeological evidence, historians are in greater agreement on the existence of the last three kings, though it's possible that two of them might have been the same man. That brings us to Lucius Tarquinus. He ruled from 616 BCE to 578 BCE. He and his son will both be the kings of Rome, and it's these two that some historians think might have, in fact, been the same person. But for the purpose of this presentation, we'll go with what the Romans said. We'll keep them as two separate people, father and son. Lucius Prisus, also known as Tarquin the Elder, wasn't actually from Rome. His father was a wealthy Greek merchant from the city-state of Corinth. When the politics of the city-state of Corinth changed, Tarquin's father moved to a region north of Rome known as Etruria. The people that lived there were called Etruscans, and they were basically everything the Romans of that time period wanted to be. According to the legends slash histories, Etruria was a nation that came from Greece, but also had connections to the Asiatic peoples as well. They had art, culture, a strong economy, and according to the Romans, some very loose morals. For the purpose of this lecture, we will not get into it, but feel free to research the Etruscans a bit. So for the Romans, they could both envy and loathe the Etruscans. It's into this situation that Tarquin's father moves into Etruria, a land not unlike the Greece he had just left. Tarquin would grow up here, not far from Rome. When he was old enough to leave the home, 
he went south, into Rome, to find greater opportunities. When he arrives in Rome, he brought with him Greek culture, ideas, but most importantly, because of his father, vast sums of wealth. To say that he was popular in Rome would be an understatement. Upon his arrival, he quickly becomes friends with Ansus Marcius, the current leader of Rome. Their friendship grows stronger until Ansus Marcius dies, and Tarquin sees his chance. Ansus had two sons that Tarquin would have to deal with. As the family friend, he sends both boys out of the city shortly after their father dies, and in their absence, he declares himself king. Both boys will now live in exile, and for the following decades, will repeatedly challenge Tarquin for power. Maybe it's guilt for how he betrayed them, compassion for human life, or for some political benefit, but Tarquin doesn't have the two sons killed for their repeated attempts. More likely, because the Roman historians were pretty much just storytellers, it made for some really good drama to keep those two around. During his time in power, Tarquin the Elder will lay the foundations for Rome's largest entertainment venue, the Circus Maximus, famous throughout history for its incredible chariot races. And while he made possible some pretty fast chariot races, Tarquin the Elder himself would not be fast enough to escape his fate, and he would eventually be assassinated by the sons of Ansus Marcius. Tarquin's wife would cover up his death, telling the people that he had received a head injury, but was recovering. During that time, she summoned Servius Tullius, her son-in-law, to her home. She announced that he would lead while her husband recovered. Her deception provided Servius Tullius the time he needed to strengthen his position within Rome. And when it was revealed that Tarquin the Elder had, in fact, died, Tullius was ready to hold on to the position. Or so Servius Tullius thought. You see, Tarquin the Elder also had sons. Dun dun dun! Servius Tullius ruled from 578 BCE to 534 BCE. Smart guy, who still ends up being killed. Probably by the people he least expected. So Servius paid attention to history. He saw that it was a son of Ansus Marcius that was the eventual end of Tarquin the Elder. Servius knows that he's displaced Tarquin's sons, and basically taken the throne from them. So he tries to prevent his own murder by making nice with the sons of Tarquin the Elder. Servius marries his daughters to both of the sons, hoping that will create stability between the two families. While in power, his two greatest achievements were the reformation of how voting occurred, as well as the military. He tied wealth to both one's ability to vote, as well as one's obligation for military service. The wealthier you were, the more voting power you had. However, you were also expected to provide dramatically more for Rome's defense, both financially and with your own flesh and blood. This made sense to them. They believed that only those with a lot to lose would make smart decisions on the battlefield, as well as in politics. In addition, he reorganized the Roman army, making it more efficient and capable. His end would come in an unexpected way. Tarquin Superbus, the son of Tarquin the Elder, and his wife, Servius' own daughter, plot his overthrow. One day, Superbus storms into the main assembly of the Roman government takes his father-in-law's seat, and basically declares himself the leader. Servius, learning of this event, rushes back, only to have Tarquin Superbus attack him, pick him up, and throw him across the room. Stumbling from the building, Servius tries to return home. His daughter, hearing that her plans appear to have been successful, then goes to the assembly to confirm with her husband that he actually did overthrow her father. Her father, the man she just betrayed, is attacked and killed by a mob of Tarquin supporters. Once she arrives at the building, her husband, the new king, tells her to return home. She does, and as she's riding away in her chariot, she sees her father's body and orders her driver to run it over. So the next time you think that your family has problems, just remember the story of King Servius and his daughter. Now, if you'll excuse me, on a completely unrelated note, um, I think I'm going to go buy my daughter that pony she's been asking for. Uh, yeah. So now we've got the reign of Lucius Tarquinus Superbus, and he ruled from 534 BCE to 509 BCE. During that time, he waged a number of military campaigns against Rome's neighbors. More importantly, he's credited with the creation of Rome's largest drainage system, known as the Cloaca Maxima. It allowed for Rome to empty nearby swamps and expand the amount of usable land, while also reducing the breeding grounds for disease-spreading insects like mosquitoes. 
his time as king would end, not because of his own actions, but because of his sons. While away from Rome on a military campaign, Superbus's son and other male members of the family were partying and bragging about how awesome their wives were, how each one of them was the model Roman woman. For the Romans, this meant that their women were tending to the home and behaving in a way that wouldn't embarrass their husbands or fathers. One of the men made it perfectly clear that his wife, Lucretia, was the best of them all. The men all agreed to a challenge. They would ride back to Rome and check in on their wives. Turns out, all of the other women were partying and ignoring their wifely duties. However, Lucretia, as promised, was the model Roman woman. She was home, managing the house and making fabric. One of Superbus's sons, upon seeing Lucretia, immediately felt an uncontrollable desire to have her. He snuck back to Rome, broke into Lucretia's house, and forced her into bed with him. He made it clear to her that if she refused, he would kill his own slave and claim to have caught both the dead man and Lucretia in an affair. In Roman society at the time, embarrassing your husband in such a way was as good as a death sentence. After he rapes her, he returns to the army. Lucretia immediately called for her family and told them of the event, forcing them to swear that they would punish Sextus Tarquinus. Gripped by shame and humiliation, Lucretia stabs herself in the heart before anyone can stop her. Have you ever heard the term death before dishonor? Well, the Romans were pretty big on it, at least in their stories, and the double standard between the expectation for men and women was pretty high. The rape of Lucretia creates such a controversy within the city that the people of the city demand an end to the Tarquins. Superbus, upon learning of this upheaval happening in his city, leaves the army and rushes back to Rome, only to find the gates of the city closed to him. At the same time, news of what happened reached his army, and his own soldiers turned against his family. Unwelcome in Rome, the Tarquins now depart, exiled forever. So, that terrible act against Lucretia will be the end of the Roman kings and the birth of the Roman Republic. Thanks for listening. Would you like the note template and quiz that go with this lecture? Need additional project packets for your students? Find those and get access to even more topics and resources by going to www.teacherspayteachers.com forward slash store forward slash breakout history. Please like and subscribe to receive notices when more free lecture videos arrive.